This bar hits. Holy God. Look down from above. Look at the faces of your children. Look at their hearts. They desperately need you. From their questions, it's obvious that they need help. Don't turn your back on them. Don't turn your back on this nation. Let your glory shine once again on this nation. Speak to us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. When we began this conference, I introduced the pursuit of justification, of sanctification. And I said there are three aspects. I have given us positional, experiential, experiential sanctification. And I was, I'm holding back the last one, the ultimate sanctification. And I'll still hold it back until I finish this charge. Well, the charge is nothing but something to help us reflect on why we are here, on why we are here. But before I go, or before I do that, I have a, a woman in our midst who is indeed a big arm of this ministry for the last 18 or 19 years. Has traveled to Nigeria, Nuka Kona, just Aba Owere, Isukwato, just name it. Eating what I as A resident don't even eat. And I want her to just, she's been to Nigeria more than, I don't know, more than a dozen times. I just want her to say a few words of greetings before I close. Give her hands to Debbie Hager. Many other countries, people know we're here, 
and they know about you, and they're praying for you too. So, Godspeed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The, my question is this Who are you? Who are you? Are you somebody that just appeared from nowhere? Or are you here by an accident? Believing that there's no accident in God's program. And so, who are you? You say, well, I'm born again. Or, I, or I'm this person or that person. Let me ask again, who are you in the eyes of God? Well, I have come up with, there may be many more, but nine important things to describe who you are in God's eyes. As you write down or you re reflect on this, Nine things. Ask yourself a question. What must I do? As the African director led us in prayer, how can I contribute to the restoration of this nation? Knowing that it is because of me that this nation has gone this far. Who are you? Number one, you are a believer in Christ. You are a believer in Christ. Throughout my teaching, or our teaching, we have demonstrated that once you are in position with Christ, you remain there. Because it is the work of God. Paul understood this very well on his way to Damascus. He understood this truth when he encountered the Lord himself. Paul was going to attack Christians when the Lord met him. And he heard a voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That was when he realized that a persecution of a Christian is a persecution of Christ. Because you are in his body. <coughs> Who are you? Your life has been hidden in Christ and Christ in God to provide you maximum security that heaven can offer. You are not ordinary. You are extraordinary. Because of where you are in Christ. Because you are in Christ, you share everything that Christ has. According to Romans 8, 17. You co-pair with him. That's a privilege God has given to you. To co-share the inheritance of his son. That is grace. Don't forget that. You are in Christ. You can never get out of that cycle or out of that position. Paul said it so clearly. I am convinced that neither life or death, nothing, nor things to come, not even your own present failures, will be able to separate you from that place in Christ Jesus. Who are you? 
Number two, you are a temple of God. You are a temple of God. Sometimes what, what makes us, or what, uh, what causes us to lose sight of who we are is ignorance of who we are. Ignorance of what we, who we are often causes us to lose sight. A temple. Just imagine. Take a look. This building is not yet completed. Last year, I was called to speak in one of the big mega churches in town. It was like I was, I haven't been to Hollywood. But it looked like I was in the Hollywood, just by the picture. All kinds of light. Blue, gray, yellow. The temple, was, the altar was like, uh, you're already close to heaven. Screen everywhere. It was like, wow, is it a church or somewhere else? You look on the wall, you look everywhere, you say, is this in Nigeria? Am I in Nigeria? Beautifully decorated. Sanctuary. But something is missing. It's not that building. It's you. You are that temple. You are the temple of God. God doesn't live there. He lives in you. In the time of Solomon, they had a beautiful, Solomon had a magnificent temple built for God inside the Holy of Holies. That's where God in the world, in between the cherubim in the, in the ark, in the middle, the Bible tells us he dwells in between the cherubim, according to 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, as the Shekinah glory. Dwelling there guarantees guaranteed blessing to Israel, guaranteed protection, guaranteed provision. They never go to war without the ark carrying the presence of God with them. That was human, human hand, human construction. But Jesus said, something will be changed. When I go to the Father, there is going to be a, a new era. That magnificent temple you are looking will no longer be there. You will be that temple. In the temple of Solomon, temple is a place of worship. Now God has called you so that they can have communion, worship within you. That's why Paul says to the Corinthians, in all their lifestyle, don't you know? Don't you know who you are? Don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Don't you know that you are the temple of God? Who endures you? Why are you doing like this? Why are you behaving like this? Don't you know who you are? Don't you know that you are special? That the God of the universe has elected to endure in you? When we understand what it means, that the creator is indwelling his creature, it will change the way we think. As you are sitting down now, God is indwelling you. The one who created the entire universe is indwelling you. I'm not saying he will indwell you. He is already in you. Jesus in you, the hope of glory.
Let me tell you, God, it has never been in, it has never happened in history. Not in the time of David, and yet David was great. Not in the time of Moses, and yet Moses was mighty. It has never happened in the history when God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit indwell his creature unto the church. To whom much is given, much is required. I don't know what would have become of Moses if the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit had indwelled him. And yet he was mighty. You are the temple, not temporary, permanent temple of God. And Paul goes on in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 17, he says, whoever plays with this temple, he himself will pay the penalty. Who are you? You can change it if you have trusted in Christ. It's too late. You're already a temple. Who are you? Number three, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. What does light do? Light dispels darkness. Where there is darkness, is only the reason is that there is no light there. If there is darkness in Nigeria, there is only one that can produce light, and that's us, and that's you. In a family, if there's a darkness in a family where a Christian is, you can only explain it in one way. The wiring is faulty. The wiring of that believer is faulty, that he is not producing light. You are the light of the world. Matthew 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. You are not the real light. Jesus Christ is the real light. Shining through you. Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1, 27. Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Who are you? Number four. You are the salt of the world. You are the salt of the world. Again, number four, you are the salt of the world. Just think of what God has made you so far. He has made you, he has, first of all, in order to even start the business, he secured it. Because he can't do anything until you are secured. You can't carry anything until your, your feet is balanced. In order for God to use you, the first thing he did is to secure your position. And your position is in Christ. As the Bible says, you can do nothing apart from me. Being in Christ means you tap into his power. You tap into his strength. You tap into his wisdom. You tap into his knowledge. And then you can start. You are a temple. You are a light. Add to that, you are a salt. There are at least two important qualities of salt. At least two important that are pertinent to this teaching or this charge. Salt gives taste and it, it also preserves, serves as a preservative. When you, when there is, when that preservative power is lost, there's decay. See, righteousness preserves a nation. When you lose that power of preservation, the nation decays. The reason why you see Nigeria decaying is because the, there is no preserving power. Wow. 
when evil, when righteousness comes up, evil takes a vacation. When righteousness takes a vacation, evil comes out and rules. Right now, righteousness is on vacation. And that's why it's in every branch, evil is dominating. Because nothing is challenging it. Who are you? You are salt. Another salt does it, it gives taste. Another thing salt does it gives taste. You say, how can I give taste? How do I how, how can I produce taste? The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How? You see, we often preach. And people sit there and say, how? How, Pastor, how do I do it? We tell members, yield, yield, brother, yield to Christ. How? Do I just come and say, Lord, here I am, I'm yielding. How? But we fail to explain how. When the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good, the question is how? Do you have to stick your tongue going in the air and say, mm, Lord, where are you? I want to taste you. How? So simple. When you stand, you are the salt. Can I, can I follow you? We are looking at the salt right here. This is the salt that represents heaven. I don't know anything about heaven. But this is the representative. Taste and see that the Lord is good. When he, when he speaks of the love of God, when I experience the love from him unparalleled, I'm tasting the love of God. God is merciful. When he expresses the mercy of God, I'm tasting God's mercy through him. God is kind. When he expresses kindness to me in a way unparalleled, I know that this is unique. Is coming from his God. God is compassionate. When he expresses compassion to me, I am tasting heaven on earth. By looking at him, I already have a picture of heaven that will be done on earth. Thank you. You are the salt. Which means wherever you are, people ought to taste Christ through you. Your action, whatever you do. I remember vividly when I was perhaps four or five years, six, I forgot. But it, I, I have a memory that doesn't forget things. Even things that happened when I was three years old, I still remember them. We grew up in a large family. And we were eating. One day, we, we ate from one bowl. Of, we, we normally eat together. And as we were eating, the soup, my mother forgot to put soup in, put salt in the soup. It was tasteless, completely. We are hungry, but we are Chew! Zero! She forgot completely. All the ingredients were there, but there was no salt. My sister, she's right here. She asked for, for my younger brother to go get us salt. He ran quickly into the house and grabbed a pinch and came and dumped in the soup. She, she turned it. And we ate, <laughs> what's wrong? The same. She told him again, and she ran and grabbed him even more. The taste was the same. She finally said, go get me the plate. She ran inside and brought the plate. And before she put it inside the soup, she took a pinch and put it in her tongue. And we were, all eyes were on her for the verdict. And she 
look, did like this. She said, that's not salt. That's cornstarch. That's cornstarch. Dried pap. No wonder, no matter at the amount, it's not changing the taste of the soup. You may laugh, but consider my question. What kind of salt are you? When you are around people, do you produce the taste of heaven? When you are in the church, do you produce the taste of Christ? Who are you? Number five. You are the fifth gospel. You are the fifth gospel. My brother told you yesterday that there are four gospels. And he said to you that I will tell you the fifth one. I'm just doing it now. There are, fifth there are five gospels, all right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. You are the fifth one. Many people don't care to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they read you. Yes, yes, yes. Every day. If you are a spouse, your spouse reads you every day. When you wake, when you wake up, once she sees or he sees that your eyes are open, she starts reading. Or he starts reading. Your children read you. In a workplace, your, your co-workers read you. It's not what you tell them, it's what they are reading. If what you tell them match with what they are reading, how compelling is that story? If you tell them that my God is good, that's a testimony. And I look at your life, it expresses it. I want your God to be good to me too. How can I do that? You are the fifth gospel. Your life either brings people to Christ or it runs them away. Your life is important. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2, that you are, you are an epistle, written not with hand, read by all. It's an open letter. You carry a mark of Christ on you. See, Paul brought people to Christ in the prison. Paul was not preaching to them. Paul was whipped, lacerated, Roman style. He was bleeding, chained, wrongly beaten. Because as a Roman citizen, that was against the law. But he wasn't complaining. In a prison, he was rejoicing. The Bible tells us he was singing melody in the middle of the night. Other prisoners were watching them. That's what the Bible says. They have never seen people bleeding and at the same time singing. That's not a good combination. That's a mysterious combination. You see them bleeding and they are joyful. They're not pretending. There's something radiating through their faces to the point that they captivated the entire prisoners. That's what we call fifth gospel. God opened the windows and the doors, removed their chains. They did it wrong. Integrity. The law puts us here, the law will take us here. When the jailer saw all these things, there's only one more question to ask. What do I do to be like you? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be like me. You are the fifth gospel. Never forget that. Number six. 
You are a fragrance of Christ. You are a fragrance of Christ. You are a fragrance of Christ. We all love perfume, don't we? We love cologne. Don't you love cologne or perfume? Perfume for women, cologne for men. Well, there's also bad perfume. I don't want to be around one. It's choking. In the Middle East, they have very powerful choking cologne or perfume. They carry their perfume in their wallet and purse. Every now and then they spray. If, they, if, they, if you catch them in an elevator, fresh, and it's choking. If, they, if you are going to the 20th floor, you just pray, oh God, may they get out of second floor. <laughs> but it is a good perfume. You go closer to the person and say, wow. What kind of, you try to gaze, what kind of cologne is this? You want the person to come to your last floor because that whole elevator has been covered with good scent. But you are the perfume of Christ. You are the fragrance of Christ. I didn't say that, the Bible says that. Second Corinthians 2.15. For we are a fragrance of Christ. I said, I didn't say that. I just find it in the scripture. You, we are a fragrance of Christ to God. Among those who are being saved, among those who are perishing, you are a fragrance to your fellow members in the church. You are also a fragrance to those outside the church. What does it mean? When people are around you, they must smell Christ. Seven. Who are you? You are a banner of Christ's love. You are a banner of Christ's love. A, I'm sorry, a badge. A badge, not a banner. You are a badge of Christ's love. How do you recognize a Christian? By the look? Can I look at you and say, oh, you are a Christian? How can I know who is a Christian and who is not? There is only thing that divides the world and Christianity, love. And Jesus said it in John 13, 34, and 35. You shall, a new commandment I give to you. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciple, if you have love for one another. Three times the Lord used the word love in two verses. What marks you out from the rest is that love. It is, it is not just love. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. No, this is supreme love produced by the Holy Spirit. For the love is fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22. For the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. Unbelievers cannot display this love because it's produced by the Holy Spirit. This is a love that goes extra mile. This is a love when it's demonstrated, it puts the world silent. This is the type of love that you will find a believer taking care of a fellow believer in a hospital that don't even relate to each other. You find him or her sleeping there, caring for a person that doesn't relate to him. And, and the nurse will come to him and say, is that your senior brother? He said, no. How, how do you relate to him? You are first cousin. He said, no. He is my brother in Christ. And he's been sleeping here every day. 
that person will not sleep that night because he's been thinking about that. What kind of love is this? That's what Jesus said, by this, the world will know that you belong to me. You are a badge. That's the only way they can recognize you. Not by clapping hands and jumping up and down and saying, hallelujah, amen, amen. Everybody can say, amen, amen. Satan can even say, that, well, amen, amen. But he doesn't have that law. Who are you, number eight? You are a banner of peace. You are a banner of peace. Proverbs 16, verse 7. Proverbs 16, verse 7. When your life is pleasing to God, He keeps your enemies at bay. When your life is pleasing to God, he makes sure that no one troubles him. He doesn't say you will not go through suffering because suffering is designed to help you build up the peace. That happened to Jehoshaphat. For 10 years, Jehoshaphat did not, nobody made war against him because God gave him peace on every side because of his life. When your life is pleasing to God, he gives your enemy a distance. That was true of Solomon until he fell. In 1 Kings chapter 11, he fell in verse 4. And in verse 11, God raised adversary. Who are you? Finally, number nine, you are a vessel of blessing. You are a vessel of blessing. You are a channel of blessing. Through you, God runs blessings to your family, to the country. Blessing by association. Potiphar, an unbeliever, was blessed beyond measure because of Joseph. Joseph was a channel of blessing to Potiphar and his entire household. In Proverbs 10, 11 verse 10, the first part of, of verse 10, Proverbs 11, 10, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. Verse 11, the first half, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. By your blessing, Nigeria will once again see a sunshine. Amen. Brethren, now this brings my last, it's not a, it's not only one minute, the ultimate, sanctific ultimate sanctification. It's nothing but God removing you from this world and positioning you before his heavenly throne, whereby there will be an internal worship. For he has set you apart for an internal worship. There will be praise. There will be internal singing, worshiping the creator forever and ever and ever. For this is the purpose for our creation. This is the purpose why you are here, for the praise of his glory. You are not here to praise yourself. You are not here to glorify yourself. You are not here to make name for yourself. You are here reading yourself for an internal worship. For this reason, God created you according to Isaiah 43, verse 7. People whom I created for my glory. And Jesus, Paul said it for the praise of his glory. And so join me as we read together in closing. We we'll read together. Thank God we have this projection. 
First Corinthians chapter 50. So chapter 15. Beginning from verse 15. Beginning from verse 50 through 58. We are going to read together. Would you mind stand as we read the scripture together? One, two, go. Brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and will be changed. For this imperishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, there is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your stain? The stain of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that you are tall is not in vain in the Lord. May the Lord bless you.